And uh, at this moment, I would I'm pleased to inform you that our inaugural session is to begin and will include four video messages from Mr. Martin Chungong, the Secretary General of the IPU, Ms. Michelle Bachelet, UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Ms. Patricia Scotland, QC, Secretary General of the Commonwealth, and Ambassador Elizabeth Tihi Fisselberger, President of the UN Human Rights Council. Let us first listen to Mr. Martin Chugong's welcome remarks. Dear Madam High Commissioner for Human Rights, dear President of the UN Human Rights Council, dear members of Parliament, distinguished colleagues from the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, I wish to extend to you all a warm welcome. I also wish to thank the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights and the Commonwealth Secretariat for their collaboration in organizing this event. These are extraordinary times and the fact that we are meeting virtually underscores this reality. It is precisely in times of crisis that we should remain vigilant to ensure that human rights and checks to state use, the use of state power are respected. It is in this regard that parliaments have a strong role to play when it comes to ensuring stringent oversight of government actions. I am pleased that this seminar will look at mechanisms that can help address the situation and the role of uh, parliaments in addressing the human rights ramifications of state efforts against the COVID-19 pandemic. You will also devote significant time to discussing the work of the UN Human Rights Council, which under its universal periodic review, examines the human rights situation of each country every four and a half years. In fact, this seminar places strong emphasis on the UN Human Rights Council in the belief that parliaments can make a strong contribution to its work. It is also an opportunity to reflect on the notion that the Council stands much to gain from such parliamentary involvement. Now, why are parliaments so important to the Council's work? Parliaments can help ensure that what the Council does is fully connected to national realities. Human rights are not technical matters and should not be left in the hands of government representatives and experts alone. Human rights often require tough political discussions and decisions. The political component is therefore inevitable. Parliaments can help promote public debate on human rights and seek input from all segments of society. Moreover, they can lend democratic legit legitimacy to the outcome of that debate and galvanize public support for implementation. How does this translate into concrete parliamentary input into the work of the Council? Parliaments can take the lead in critically reviewing the draft reports that the Executive has prepared for submission to the Human Rights Council. Parliamentarians can also see for themselves how representatives of the Executive present and defend their report before the Council. Such Direct exposure helps them to better understand the concerns that the Council expresses and facilitates subsequently an informed debate in Parliament. Once the Council has adopted its recommendations, it is critical that they are brought back to Parliament and seriously discussed because they often require legislative action and budgetary resources. The recommendations are also very useful in that they give parliaments a concrete tool to hold government to account for their human rights performance. Parliaments play a critical role too in turning the reporting cycle into a continuous one. Countries only report every four and a half years to the Human Rights Council. There is a risk that in the meantime its recommendations are neglected 
parliaments can therefore ensure that rep recommendations remain on the agenda by asking the executive for yearly progress reports. Ladies and gentlemen, what do we hope to achieve with this webinar? Let me mention two concrete outcomes. First, we hope that this meeting will lead to a better understanding of the human rights challenges facing us at this time of crisis and of the work of the Human Rights Council and its Universal Periodic Review, as well as the UN Human Rights Treaty bodies. Second, it is our hope that the webinar will lead to a stronger contribution of members of parliament to the three different stages of the Universal Periodic Review. We hope that the presentation of several national case studies of parliamentary involvement in the UPR can serve as an inspiration to other parliaments. Moreover, the third session of this webinar will look more closely at the UPR recommendations for each participating country with the aim of hearing from participants how they wish to commit themselves and mobilize their colleagues to seek implementation of these recommendations. In doing so, it is important as well that participants reflect on how they can enhance cooperation with other stakeholders, including your national human rights institution and civil society. Ladies and gentlemen, we are confident that this web webinar will help bring the international human rights protection system a little closer to home, which is where human rights matter ultimately. Indeed, the yardstick for success is the extent to which the human rights discourse has led to concrete improvement of people's lives. The IPU is fully committed to working for this purpose with you and your parliaments. I wish you a very successful meeting and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Chungong, for your message. Now let's listen to Ms. Michelle Bachelet, UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. Yeah. Excellencies, colleagues, I'm pleased to address this webinar which reflects our growing partnership with the IPU and the Commonwealth Secretariat in support of parliaments. Parliaments are cornerstones of national human rights protection systems and have a critical role, especially in time of crisis. That has become ever more evident during the COVID-19 pandemic as parliaments have been key players in the discussions of human rights-based responses and the importance of addressing the needs and concerns of all, but particularly those most affected and vulnerable. Colleagues, at the national level, the role of parliaments can be enhanced through their proactive agreement with international and regional human rights mechanisms, including the Human Rights Council and the Universal Periodic Review. Parliaments play a crucial oversight role in ensuring government's compliance with its international human rights obligations and in translating them into national legislation and policies. They are also fundamental in the elaboration of national human rights action plans, which are based on international and regional human rights mechanisms and cross-linked to the Sustainable Development Goals. In other words, parliaments are a bridge between the international and national human rights arenas. They are also a channel through which the recommendations of human rights mechanisms can be implemented in the countries and translated into compliant laws and practices. Colleagues, UPR recommendations, together with those of treaty bodies and special procedures, mandate holders, aim at ensuring the fulfillment of international human rights obligations and at bolstering national human rights institutions and capacities. They also contribute to peace and the success and sustainability of efforts to achieve the SDGs by anchoring them in the solid foundation of uh, human rights norms. Their systematic implementation may even prevent violations. 
The Human Rights Council has also been exploring ways to improve the contribution of parliaments to its work and the UPR. Human Rights Council Resolution 35-29 encouraged states to promote the participation of parliaments in all stages of the UPR process, from consultations for the national report to the implementation of supported recommendations. It also requested my office to prepare a study on how to promote and enhance cooperation between parliaments and the work of the Human Rights Council and its UPR. The report we submitted to the Council in June 2018 prepared in close collaboration with the IPU, took into account a survey of parliaments worldwide. The responses show broad support for greater parliamentary engagement with the UN human rights mechanism, especially the UPR, and for the development of international principles on parliaments and human rights. Annex 1 of that report contains such principles. They are meant as a guide for parliaments in setting up or strengthening their human rights committees, as well as in ensuring their effective functioning and key responsibilities. I encourage you to consider and be guided by these principles. The UN Secretary General has called for the United Nations and the IPU to intensify efforts to assist parliaments in fulfilling their roles both in the promotion and protection of human rights. And in, the, and in the implementation of UPR recommendations. My office is fully committed to that objective, including by using its voluntary fund for UPR implementation in order to support parliaments. In that spirit of partnership, I wish you all productive discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Bachelet. I would now like to give the floor to Ms. Patricia Scotland QC, Secretary General of the Commonwealth. Honourable Members of Parliament and Legislative Assemblies, friends and colleagues, as Secretary General of the Commonwealth and on behalf of the Commonwealth Secretariat, I warmly welcome you as we begin this two-day meeting of Commonwealth parliamentarians from the Asia and Pacific regions. I also express my gratitude to the Interparliamentary Union, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and the Commonwealth Secretariat colleagues for organising this very timely workshop. As we know, the legislature is just one of three organs of the state with an obligation to respect, protect and fulfil human rights. The institutional responsibility for securing human rights and incorporating them into domestic law is of course shared with the executive and the judiciary. Within this context of shared responsibility in the area of human rights, parliamentarians have proved central to achieving the declaration's raison d'etre. The legislature is the branch of government best placed to give effect to human rights commitments and obligations, to take practical measures to prevent abuses and to ensure that law provides practical means through which remedies may be sought for alleged violations. To this end, parliamentarians are able to influence policies and budgets at the national level, exercise oversight on policy makers, monitor policy implementation programmes at local levels, address the needs and concerns of their constituencies and act as a catalyst in the realisation of human rights domestically and internationally by enacting legislation. So the vital importance of the part played by Parliament should not be downplayed or underestimated. Parliamentarians are entrusted with a special role and responsibility for promoting and protecting human rights, which are simultaneously markers of good governance and a key factor in the ability of each individual to live a life of dignity. From a parliamentary perspective, this may seem obvious, yet 
only in recent years has this view gained broad attraction at the international level as a means of addressing human rights implementation. The current pandemic has brought the critical role of parliamentarians in protecting human rights to the fore with renewed clarity and urgency. COVID-19 is more than simply a global health emergency that has brought with it severe economic and social consequences. It is also a human rights emergency. Your role as parliamentarians is central in scrutinising how governments and their agencies are managing the crisis, developing and implementing national responses and recovery plans and striking the right balance between assertive measures to control the pandemic and protecting the human rights of your constituents. Indeed, the ferocity of COVID-19 demands a redoubling of our individual and collective efforts to renew our commitment to ensuring respect for the human rights of all citizens, especially the marginalised and vulnerable who are disproportionately the first casualties in any erosion of human rights protections. And in order to put human rights at the centre of their work, many parliaments need to develop further the necessary institutional structures, processes and mechanisms. Some may need to establish parliamentary committees, oversight bodies with exclusive human rights mandates. This is an area in which Commonwealth mutual support and cooperation are particularly needed. Of our members, 32 are small states, most of which are small island developing states. Parliaments in these countries face specific challenges in terms of their small size and limited support staff, for instance, high quality legal advisors, researchers and legislative drafters. This makes it difficult to establish standalone committees and to address effectively the technical and complex nature of rights issues. The Commonwealth Secretariat and our other Commonwealth bodies support parliaments in addressing these particular challenges and we will continue to provide assistance to those that require it. As Eleanor Roosevelt said, it isn't enough to talk about peace. One must believe in it. And it isn't enough to believe in it. One must work at it. The same sentiment must apply to our collective ambition to fully realise enjoyment of human rights. As a key Commonwealth value, respect for human rights must be constant and at the core of all that we do. So I take this opportunity to thank each and every one of you for participating in this virtual meeting. What we craft together to enable us to deliver on those promises embedded in our charter will benefit all of the 2.4 billion people we jointly serve. Thank you, Ms. Cotton. The last remarks will be coming from Ambassador Elizabeth Tiki Fisseberger who is the current president of the UN Human Rights Council. Ladies and gentlemen, honorable members of parliament, 
It is a privilege and a pleasure to welcome you to this webinar on how to make the Human Rights Council cooperate even better with national parliaments. I would like to thank the Interparliamentary Union, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and the Secretariat of the Commonwealth for the brilliant idea of organizing this webinar. And I very much thank the Secretary General of the IPU, Mr. Martin Chungong, for inviting me to address you today. It is my great honor to be the President of the Human Rights Council this year. This has given me the opportunity to see a bit more of the Council's inner nuts and bolts and realize what an incredible machinery it is. This machinery literally involves thousands of people, different groups of stakeholders, as we say in the UN jargon, all of whom participate in making the Council's mandate come true, that is to say, promote and protect human rights. Among these various groups, we have the diplomats, like myself, who are there to speak on behalf of their own countries. They often get criticized by civil society for not being sufficiently outspoken or by other states, by other states for being too outspoken. Their job is to keep all channels of conversation open and to build bridges in spite of existing problems and different interests and to act as two-way interpreters, explaining in their capitals what happens at the UN and vice versa. Another group of stakeholders are civil society organizations, many of whom work on the ground, admittedly much closer than diplomats to where human rights violations can occur. Civil society organizations help the Council collect information about what is going on all over the world. There is an enormous variety among NGOs with regard to the subjects or regions they cover, but also with regard to the quality and reliability of their work. Some of them have won Nobel Prizes, as you know, others clearly never will. Yet another group of stakeholders are the so-called special mandate holders. All in all, about 70 persons who work for the councils as special rapporteurs, independent experts, or commissions of inquiry, these are different shades of mandates, to research on the situation in a particular country or with regard to a specific topic of human rights. These mandate holders are specialists, professors, judges, practitioners, who are often called the eyes and ears of the council. As you can imagine, they are not always very popular in the countries where they conduct their research. After all, their job is to diagnose deficiencies and make recommendations on how to redress them. And then there is the universal periodic review, the special focus of this webinar. The UPR was one of the most innovative ideas when the Human Rights Council was established in 2006. The inspiration for it came from the International Labour Organization's Committee of Experts on the Application of Conventions and Recommendations, which one of its former Directors General very appropriately described as unwritten wisdom based on a firm adherence to accepted international standards, a scrupulous thoroughness, the strictest objectivity, recognition of the need for a sympathetic understanding of what lies beyond the letter of the law, of problems of timing and practical difficulties, and acceptance of the duty to observe the highest standards of tact and courtesy in the valuation of complex and delicate problems. This is quite a tall order. The UPR is not only a useful tool for nudging states to embark on sensitive issues. As opposed to some of the mandate holders, it is also quite popular with states, presumably because all countries are treated equally. No one is more equal than others. Self-confident, prosperous countries are often surprised about how many recommendations they get. While countries would show a lot of goodwill, but lack resources, and this is, after all, the majority of countries on this planet are treated with what the Director General called tact and courtesy. The UPR is a four and a half year cycle. That means that every country is reviewed every four and a half years. And up to now, it's scored 100% participation by all the member states of the United Nations. So it is genuinely universal. All the various groups of stakeholders whom I mentioned, the High Commissioner, her office, the mandate holders and civil society participate in the effort and prepare reports, analyzing the country under review from various angles. Experience shows that this review is taken very seriously. Usually at least one minister personally travels to Geneva to present the national report and answer questions and recommendations. If the media shows some interest, governments are even more motivated. 
This is where national parliaments come in. As you probably know, the Human Rights Council does not have any legally binding instruments. And there is no such thing as a universal human rights court, however much some academics discuss the idea. Yet human rights are only worth their name if they get implemented. And the most reliable way of doing so is to make them a legal reality at the domestic level. Incidentally, the Council dealt with the importance of national parliaments again and again. Four years ago, for example, it appealed to national parliaments to help translate international human rights commitments into national policies and laws. It also recommended to parliamentarians to travel to Geneva as part of their government delegations and listen to the three-hour debate on their country. As you're going to hear later on, the UPR process lasts several months for any country under review, from dressing up the national report to presenting it to the Council, receiving recommendations and finally implementing them. The Council, in its resolution 35-29, encouraged members of Parliament to join in whenever they choose to do so. Two years ago, the Office of the High Commissioner, in cooperation with the IPU, presented a report on how to strengthen synergies between parliaments and the Human Rights Council. This report focused very much on the importance of parliamentary human rights committees and included a draft principles on parliaments and human rights, for example, on how to set up such committees, their working methods, etc. I realize that parliamentarians have a very full agenda, and all of this may sound rather time-consuming to you. But please do give a thought to the fact that the UPR is a very solid stock-taking exercise which can help to get some things done at a speed suitable for the country in question. Of course, the current year is somewhat special. The UPR round originally scheduled for May had to be postponed to November and we shall see whether traveling will be back to normal by then. I am happy to say that the Human Rights Council as a whole managed to adjust rather well to the special situation. We had a lockdown as from March and needed to find new ways of working because the COVID crisis is not only a health emergency and an economic crisis as a consequence, but importantly, also a major human rights crisis. It somehow worked like a magnifying glass for existing human rights issues, in particular for what we call the vulnerable groups of the population. So for the first time, we had to organize virtual conversations and managed to adopt the so-called President's Statement on the human rights implications of the pandemic by way of a silence procedure. This statement requests the High Commissioner to report on a regular basis about the human rights implications of the pandemic with a view to help building back better, as the Secretary General keeps saying. The Human Rights Council is a machinery which provides the world with reliable and up-to-date information. It is supposed to address both protracted and looming human rights issues. I am convinced that this webinar will help you see the added value which the Human Rights Council can have for your work and will also show you where parliaments could have some added value for the international human rights work being done. Thank you very much for your interest. I wish you a very interesting session. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for your opening remarks. Um, we would like now to give the opportunity to participating MPs to briefly present themselves uh, by simply giving, taking the floor and giving their first name and last name so that everyone can be acquainted with them and uh, so that uh, those participating today can put a name on a face and vice versa. I would also like to remind to all of, the, all of us who uh, just joined to please uh, switch the cameras on so we may see them. And uh, well, I will begin by recalling that this workshop is dedicated to Commonwealth member parliaments in Asia and the Pacific. And this includes uh, the following countries. I will list uh, the participating countries uh, who have uh, MPs present today. The alphabetical order, Australia, Fiji, Kiribati, Malaysia, Maldives, Pakistan, and Tonga. Uh, let us begin first with Australia. I am now giving the floor to the participating MPs from the Australian Parliament.
this new. Well, a very good afternoon to you all. It's uh, nearly dinner time here in Australia. Uh, I am the chair of the Australian Parliamentary Committee on Human Rights, and I'm also joined by uh, the deputy chair, Graham Perrett, and we're um, really looking forward to participating in this uh, very constructive discussion on human rights. Our committee is a technical scrutiny committee, so we scrutinise all bills and instruments for compatibility with international human rights laws. Um, so we play, that is the role that we play, and we don't have any formal role in relation to the UPR, but we certainly remain very engaged in, in many of the issues and really looking forward to uh, the discussion today. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I believe um, the next uh, in alphabetical order is Fiji. If we could uh, then uh, have the MPs from Fiji present themselves. Thank you, moderator. Uh, Bula, and good evening to you all uh, from Fiji. Uh, it's almost 6.30 p.m. over here. Um, almost very soon it will be our bedtime. But nevertheless, we uh, have much pleasure and uh, it's a privilege for us to be joining uh, this webinar this evening over here, which is, we believe it's very important for us to actually talk on human rights and how we as parliamentarians, we are actually pulling through this hard time of COVID-19. Um, basically, I'm the chairperson on justice law and human rights. Uh, all the bills, they are actually presented to my committee. Unfortunately, we don't have our committee members over here this evening. Uh, but I'm hopeful that they'll be actually joining us uh, for tomorrow evening session. Uh, with me, I have my senior secretary staff over here, uh, senior secretary for my committee, Mr. Ira, as well as some other members as well. Uh, so it's a privilege for me to be part of this particular webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we really do appreciate that uh, you could have joined our meeting at this late hour. Uh, next on the list is uh, Kiribati. Please turn on your microphone. I'm afraid we can't hear you. I'm sorry, I'm afraid your Hello? microphone is turned off, sir. You need to unmute your microphone. Yes, sir. I thought I have. What did happen? Uh, I suggest you you ask somebody else to talk. Well, uh, we'll try and, and and fix the problem from our side. It's it's working now. You can introduce yourself, please. Go ahead. It's working now. Okay, thank you. Well, I you know there are two of us from uh, from campus. We are very keen to, to be involved in this meeting, and uh, I want to extend uh, the. Whom greetings to, to, to all the participants in, in this uh, uh, our workshop. The area of human rights is now to us because right in from the beginning when we achieved our independence in 1979, the first real the, the first few clauses uh, uh, they mentioned about the how human rights, the base human rights that government was, uh, uh, respect when they govern the, uh, the when they govern the government. Uh, at the people and but in the process since then there's very little work in terms of the of, of, of the world's parliament on human rights and this i guess it is due to the fact that the government from the beginning up to now has 
I still be so what you have no real interest in, in the thing. And that's why uh, we hope that as a result of this meeting, we should be able to get more interest on the part of our comments to try and, and get the, the MPs in the parliament to be involved in the in the in the in the process, UPR uh, process. Because as I said, there's very little that has been going on yeah, in Kipas. I've been in parliament for some years now. Uh, and uh, I am a member of the opposition. Um, I'm very pleased to be uh, participating involved in this meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, then we can move on to the next MP. I believe the next is Malaysia. Hi everyone, good afternoon. My name is Kasturi Patu. I am a second term member of parliament from Malaysia. Um, we are in a very delicate situation in Malaysia because not only are we facing a health crisis, an economic crisis, but also a political crisis, which is a recipe for disaster. Um, so, and we all know that at the height of political crisis, human rights tend to suffer the most next to economy and um, health as well. So I'm privileged to be amongst my esteemed fellow colleagues, and I hope to be able to share and learn best practices from friends. Uh, I see some old friends here, and uh, I look forward to an engaging session in the hours to come. Thanks everyone and stay safe. Thank you very much. Uh, I believe the next is Maldives. It's um, almost afternoon here in the, in the Maldives. I'm Jihan. I represent the uh, Maldives Parliament and also. I'm sorry. The, uh, I'm, afraid I'm afraid you're still unmuted. unmuted. Hold on. I'm afraid we can't. Yeah. I hope you can hear me now. We can. Great. Um, it's, it's almost afternoon here in the Maldives. I guess we have uh, the best time of. Uh, amongst all of us <laughs> uh, at the moment for this uh, session. Um, we represent, with me, along with me is Honorable Imtiaz Fahmi, uh, Honorable Hassan Hossein, and Honorable Adam Sharif, um, um, representing the Maldives Parliament. Um, I also chair the Human Rights and uh, Gender Committee of the Parliament. Uh, with me, along with me, we have uh, representatives and also chair of the Judiciary Committee, uh, which are all very new them thematic committees established uh, uh, in our most recent, ni this 19th parliament. And it is an honor and absolute pleasure to be able to participate with uh, such an honorable uh, uh, delegation uh, uh, and several dignitaries to converse on the very most important topic uh, of the hour. Um, protecting and upholding human rights, uh, especially during such a difficult time globally. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you very much. Uh, I realize now that we have actually two MPs from Kiribati with us today. Could we have uh, the other MP from Kiribati uh, present themselves, please? I'm sorry, sir, I'm afraid we, we can't hear you. I'm so sorry, you still uh, appear as being muted. I'm so sorry, sir, we can't hear you. Uh, maybe there's some technical issues on your end. Uh, we will then continue with the presentations and, uh, and see if it works out later. Thank you. 
Then the next uh, parliamentarian is Pakistan. I'm afraid there's no sound. Honorable Pervais Malik, I'm sorry, we we can't hear you either. Oh, Hello. there we go. Hello. Can you hear me? We can hear you now. Thank you. Hello. Yes, thank you. We can hear you loud and clear. Thank you very much. I want to thank you for providing me this opportunity to participate in this important webinar in these difficult times. You know, Pakistan is also at the moment uh, going through a very difficult phase. There's much polarization and political divide and tension within the political parties. And as my colleague, the Malaysian colleague said, that political crisis a recipe for disaster for human rights. So I am here to learn and to see how to move forward and to learn from the best practices around available around here. You know, Pakistan's last UPR report uh, was presented to the Human Rights Council in November 2017 during the tenure of my government, the PMLN. And I myself was part of the government's delegation for the presentation of two treaty body reports, uh, that is CAT and ICCPR. And in the period following the UPR review in 2017, parliament had been involved in the various uh, standing committees on human rights, uh, which have been active in overseeing treaty, <coughs> sorry, body recommendations and closely examined the draft legislations, but at the moment, uh, although the human rights committees are with the oppositions in the government, yet no movement has been so far made in this direction. So I hope when things are settling down uh, a little and when we start working towards the report presentation. Because thank you very thank you very much. Uh, we're very happy to have you with us today to share your, your experience with uh, the UN treaty bodies. Uh, I believe you are the only one uh, representing Pakistan today. Yes. Uh, in that case, could we then hear uh, from Lord Fusutua from Tonga? Hi, I'm um, sorry oh, pardon, interrupt. Oh, my um, apologies. I'm also uh, joining from Pakistan. My name is um, Zili Huma, and I'm a member of the Human Rights Committee uh, for the current prevailing government. And it's an honor to be here among my esteemed colleagues. Sorry for interruption again. I just wanted to clarify this. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Zil Huma. Uh, I apologize. Uh, I, I didn't see you. Thank you very much for presenting yourself. Can we now? hear from Tonga. Thank you. Um, uh, my name is Lord Fusatua from Tonga. We don't have a um, an HR committee proper, so I'm a member of our uh, Committee on Social Services and Population and Development uh, Legislation Committee and Privileges as well, which deal with uh, most HR issues. I'm uh, here today uh, in my role as chairman of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Group on Human Rights uh, that works with the Commonwealth Secretariat. Uh, we had our first meeting, which obviously includes Australia, New Zealand and the, uh, the rest of the islands in the South Pacific. We had our first meeting in, uh, in Tonga last year, uh, with uh, which Commonwealth ran for us, which was extremely successful. So. They've been assisting us over a number of years uh, in working towards uh, instituting an NHRI and uh, Human Rights uh, Standing Committee proper. I'm also um, 
uh, Standing Committee Chairman for the AFPPD on uh, women's empowerment and gender equality. Uh, so with the work that we've done in Tonga, we've uh, able to pass various pieces of legislation which we hope comply with uh, many of the requirements of the United Nations instruments, even the ones which we haven't acceded to. So uh, I'm extremely interested to learn from other experiences today as we work towards um, establishing uh, an a NHRI and a standing committee proper. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm being told we're behind schedule, but I think uh, the other representative of Kiribati is uh, able to speak now. I'm okay now. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, thank you very much. And uh, it's good to be part of this uh, conference. And uh, we are very fortunate in Kiribati because the COVID-19 has not been in the country. So just uh, a brief uh, information about Kiribati. Uh, so uh, on, the, on the whole, we are happy with that. So uh, I think we can move ahead with the conference. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, all the MPs have had a chance to uh, present themselves, unless, uh, no, I, I do believe we have another MP from Australia. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, the, I'm Graham Perrett, the Labor MP, so in opposition, but uh, my chair, Sarah Henderson, Senator Sarah Henderson, has covered off everything. Looking forward to the participating. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, we have uh, covered all our uh, participating MPs. So just before we go ahead, I um, wanted to extend just as Pato did, hello to our old friends from Tonga Secretariat, Pato from Malaysia and uh, former President Tambay from Kiribati. It's good to see you. Here. Thank you. Uh, we will now start the different sessions of our meeting. But before we begin, let me briefly explain to you uh, how the workshop will proceed. The workshop is meant to be as interactive as possible, and each session will be addressed by discussants and a moderator. There will be no presentations, and discussants will be asked to respond briefly to questions to formulated by the moderator. After the exchange between the moderator and discussants, we will open the floor for questions and comments from participants. I am now pleased to uh, introduce and give the floor to uh, the moderator of session one, Mr. Ruhia Huizenga, who many of us know very well. Uh, I will just present him very briefly. Uh, he has 20 years of experience in handling and promoting solutions to complex uh, challenges across continents on, in the areas of human rights and parliamentary democracy. And since 2011, Mr. Huizenga has served as secretary of the IPU Committee on the Human Rights of Parliamentarians which examines and promotes solutions for individual cases of human rights violations affecting MPs. Rohir, over to you. Thank you very much, Ilya, and uh, uh, welcome, uh, dear participants, uh, to this workshop. It's, um, it's a great honor for me to be moderating the first session of, uh, of this event. Uh, and let me first of all briefly present the focus and format um, of this first session, which is entitled Parliaments, the Human Rights Council and the UN Treaty Bodies, what cooperation for mutual benefit. Um, this session will look more closely at how parliaments can and should become involved in the work of the UN Human Rights Council, its UPR, as well as the work of the UN Human Rights Treaty Bodies. Uh, we will zoom in on the examples of Tonga, Pakistan and Malaysia and discuss ongoing as well as potential future parliamentary involvement in these U UN human rights mechanisms. We will also look at how the UN Human Rights Council and the UN Committee on the, on, on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women have started to reach out to parliaments over the years. We will try to draw lessons from their engagement with parliaments and make recommendations, if we can, for further action by these and other UN mechanisms to promote stronger ties with the parliamentary community. As mentioned before, the sessions of this workshop are meant to be dynamic and interactive. Each discussion, each session will start with a short conversation between the moderator, me in this case, and discussants, 
after which the floor will be open for comments and questions from participants. Now, before we get this conversation going, let me first introduce the four discussants for this session. Uh, the first one is Mr. Johnny Magadzen. He's been working for the United Nations for the last 35 years. He was there when the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights was established in 1994. He directly assisted the first High Commissioner in those early days. He's occupied a number of senior positions at OECHR over the years, primarily in Geneva, but also in the field. Since 2017, Mr. Magazzani has been the chief of the UPR branch of OECHR, where he's responsible for all aspects regarding the UPR process. With his keen interest in ensuring national implementation of UPR recommendations, Mr. Magazzani is a strong advocate of parliamentary engagement with the UPR. Then we have Mr. Lord Fusitua, who is a member of the Parliament of Tonga. He's already introduced himself, chairperson of the Commonwealth Pacific Parliament Parliamentarian Group on Human Rights. He's a member of the board of GOPAC, Global Organization of Parliamentarians Against Corruption, and has been instrumental in working for Tonga's recent ratification of the UN Convention Against Corruption, and has been at the forefront of ensuring that its provisions um, have been translated into national uh, le legislation. Ms. Shaista Pervais Malik was a, the third discussant, was a philanthropist and a social worker before entering politics. She's a member of the National Assembly of Pakistan and currently serving her second term. She was chairperson of the Women Entrepreneur Council and worked as the secretary to the Women's Caucus from 2013 to 2018. Today, she's a member of several important committees of the National Assembly, namely on human rights, commerce, climate change, SDGs and disabilities. And last but not least, Ms. Kashuri Patel, who is a member of the House of Representatives of Malaysia. She was elected to Parliament for the first time in 2013 and was re-elected in 2018. Ms. Patel has been a strong advocate of women, women's rights. So a big welcome to the four of you. And uh, in order to start a conversation, I would first like to turn to uh, Mr. Magazzini. Um, even though we have already covered through the inaugural presentations and maybe already a little bit in the through the introductions of, of participating MPs on this, but could you briefly sum up why it is important that parliamentarians and parliaments participate in the work of the UN Human Rights Council, its UPR, and also what that participation, what that parliamentary involvement can look like? Thank you, Roger, and uh, good afternoon and good evening to all of you. It's a pleasure for me to have this opportunity to share with you a few thoughts. Just last week, we concluded uh, the 140th Member States Review in this third cycle of the UPR, and uh, as already indicated at the opening session, it is a fantastic mechanism, not only to present views and receive recommendations in the context of the Human Rights Council in Geneva, but primarily to give a sense of what needs and can be done at national level to translate international legal obligations and commitments made by the states at the international level into compliant laws and practices. And I would like to say a few things. The first point I would like to make here is that uh, we need to hear your voice and we need to see you more in Geneva. Uh, the key issue is uh, participation and it would start with the preparation of the national report by the executive. Very often the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is in the lead or the Attorney General or the Ministry of Justice. Uh, the role of parliament, the other branch of the government, is critical in ensuring that the national report contains all the relevant elements so that the review in Geneva can take that into account as well. The other important issue is to see you in the context of the discussion in Geneva. The review lasts three and a half hours, and I would like to say the best practice is when delegations of member states represent equally the three branches of the government. And we have had very few examples of that in the 140 states reviewed so far in this third cycle. Only in one case, I remember, 
that the head of delegation was an MP, and only in another case, uh, the three branches of the government were co-lead of the delegation of that particular states. And the third point is uh, Parliament needs to be involved in whatever happens afterwards at the national level. Now, one thing that uh, is happening in an increasing number of countries is that uh, national mechanisms for implementation, reporting and follow-up are being set up. I know that there was uh, not too long ago a specific principles on such uh, a mechanism and they must include also members of parliament in order for the commitments made by the states in the international body, the Human Rights Council in Geneva, and to be translated into an appropriate way at the national level. And I think the role of parliament in ensuring that the action plans are properly followed up, midterm report or yearly updates are actually being prepared by the executive with all the other stakeholders involvement i think the oversight role of the parliament in all of this is critical and i think that uh, the upr the universal periodic review of the council offer a tools to parliament to fulfill the kind of role at national and international level when it comes to human rights over to you roger Many thanks, many thanks, Gianni. Um, so it's it's clear, listening to what you're saying, um, and also based on what we've heard before, that there is a clear role for parliaments. Now, this is obviously a two-way street. Um, it's parliaments that should become more involved in the work of the UN Human Rights Council and its UPR. But of course, we also want the UN Human Rights Council to be engaging actively with parliaments. Now, what can you tell us about the extent to which the UN Human Rights Council has done that in recent years? Thank you. Well, there have been a number of resolutions, both in the General Assembly in New York and in the Human Rights Council, and they've been briefly already referred to at the opening session. And uh, those resolutions effectively have asked for the voice of parliamentarians to be included in states delegations, especially when it comes to the Human Rights Council Universal Periodic Review. Uh, one such resolution, the one of 2017, uh, that uh, has called for greater engagement on the part of parliaments with the Human Rights Council, and especially its Universal Periodic Review, has also asked uh, the Office of the High Commissioner, together with uh, in close cooperation with the IPU, to undertake a study, which has also been flagged before. But I would like to maybe unpack a little bit what was the result of that study. Uh, there was a clear indication on the part of uh, uh, parliamentarians that have answered worldwide to our questionnaire that uh, more wants to be engaged in all phases of the UPR before during the review in Geneva and in follow-up work. And the second main point is that uh, many believe that uh, having a dedicated human rights committee is a very important institutional step that would facilitate that engagement at the international, regional, whatever possible, and national levels. And I think that uh, the outcome of that uh, study has been also for us to propose draft principles on parliaments and human rights, which are annexed to this report presented in June 2018 uh, by the Office of the High Commissioner, which remains a point of reference, a guide for how parliaments worldwide that do not yet have a parliamentary committee or that have a parliamentary committee which is not yet focused also on the domestic oversight of uh, human rights uh, obligations and or commitments to be able to set one up also with the support as uh, requested by the office of the high commissioner that has a dedicated uh, voluntary fund or the ipu or the commonwealth secretariat or the broader UN system 
as uh, we are all very key and eager to ensure that this participation and engagement of members of parliaments with the UN Human Rights Council Universal Periodic Review, and of course also the treaty body, CEDAW has been mentioned, but others as well, can be facilitated. And, and the steps that needs to be taken often starts back home, and we are ready to work hand in hand with the MPs as well to share more good practices based on those uh, guidance or draft principles that have already been put forward in the 2018 report and which we hope will be soon endorsed by the UN General Assembly. Uh, if I may, we saw very recently at the September session of the General Assembly, the president of uh, one member states proposing a General Assembly resolution on the role of parliament in enhancing the advancement on the SDGs as well as on human rights. And I believe the text of that resolution, once it will be tabled and passed, will facilitate further action and engagement on the part of MPs with the UN human rights system. Over to you. Thank you, Gianni. Um, before turning now to the um, to the uh, three members of parliament who are participating as discussants in this session, I would like to ask you a last question, which is related to to the reality that countries that are being reviewed under the UPR uh, of the UN Human Rights Council they receive quite a large number of recommendations that go in different directions. Now, how do you see? Parliament's contribution to making sure, in interaction with other national stakeholders, how do you see its contribution in making sure that these recommendations are implemented? And also, in doing so, how can parliaments make sure that these recommendations, which touch on human rights, but also on other issues, are linked up to the larger SDG agenda? Well, I think that the Secretary General already a few years back has clearly indicated that more than 50% of the recommendations that are made to a state require some kind of parliamentary involvement, whether it's legislative reform, whether it is tackling issues that have to do with setting up a national independent human rights institution in launching an action plan and or addressing questions such as uh, comprehensive anti-discrimination law, decriminalizing defamation, or criminalizing domestic violence and marital rape. So you see, Parliament is key to the implementation of uh, many of the recommendations that the executive receives, and often, without any consultation with members of Parliament, accepts. I think this is an important point to take into account. Once the review has taken place, there are about three and a half months in which uh, the executive has time to consult back in the capital with multiple stakeholders. I wonder if such a discussion takes place regularly also with members of parliament, if the executive or ministers are reporting to the relevant committee in Parliament to say, this is what we have received. Many of these recommendations touch upon your work, members of Parliament, and we would like to seek your views as to next step. Very often, the executive will take decision on accepting recommendations that require parliamentary action. And then, of course, uh, the task is to see what happens afterwards in the four and a half or five years that follow now the third cycle into the fourth cycle. And that is where the role of parliament becoming critically important. Oversight of government action or inaction vis-a-vis -vis what they have accepted in front of the international community. I'm not saying here what the government has noted, because as you know, in the context of the UPR, the sovereign decision of the executive will tell the international community whether a recommendation is supported, that is to say accepted, or whether it is noted, that is to say not prioritized for action 
within this cycle. And I think that once that is being made, that decision, that sovereign decision, I think it is important for an entity such as parliament to perform its oversight function and to ensure that especially for those uh, recommendations that have been accepted by the executive and that require parliamentary action, that there is uh, an involvement, an engagement. I would say this must happen before the review. It has to be also matched by MPs being part of the review and then also in this mechanism or coordination function afterwards. But I think we are still far from that uh, point. The other element I wanted to briefly mention is that uh, there is something called the Belgrade Principles, which uh, indicates very clearly the importance of the relationship between independent national human rights institutions and members of parliament. I think, and I would like to underline how important this is in countries that have an A status national human rights institution, that there is uh, the benefit to eventually a dedicated parliamentary human rights committee coming from regular consultation with the A status national human rights institution and that that maximize the role of oversight and eventually the resulting action on the part of the states when it comes to implementation and follow up of recommendation. One final point in the third cycle, recommendations have become much sharper, much more focused, much more detailed, and therefore the expectation of the international community, starting with the High Commissioner, but also the Secretary General, is for greater implementation agenda in the context of the third cycle. And that is why on the 24th of February 2020, the Secretary General launched a call to action for human rights and indicated very clearly the importance of the UPR for all UN resident coordinators and heads of UN offices worldwide as a tool for engagement. And I think the key message there that I would like to convey to all the participating MPs is the UN is very keen to support you more in line with this general indication given by the General Assembly, by the Human Rights Council, and also by the practice of the UPR over the past uh, three years. Over to you, Roger. M many thanks, uh, Gianni, for this. Um, uh, I, I would now like to turn to, um, to the members of parliament who are participating in this, uh, in this session. Uh, and the idea is really to to get a sense from you um, as to what your parliament has been able to do uh, or not do um, in participating in these different UN human rights mechanisms. First and foremost, the UN Human Rights Council, but also the work of the UN Human Rights Treaty Bodies. Um, and then I also would like to talk a little bit to you about the potential that your parliaments may have to be more engaged, because we realize as well that this engagement, as Gianni has said it and others before as well, is, is not a given. Uh, even though there is potential, it's not necessarily happening everywhere around the world. And lastly, I would like to focus with you a little bit on the work done in parliaments uh, through parliamentary human rights committees, something that Johnny mentioned as well. But starting with the very first question, if you can give a, an, an honest assessment, uh, which can be good and bad, of how your parliament has been involved in the work of these UN human rights mechanisms, what would you say? And I would like to start with Ms. Pervais, because if I understand it correctly, you participated in two uh, Pakistani delegations to um, the reporting of two UN human rights mechanisms. And I would like to know, you know, how did this come about? Um, how did you become a member of that delegation? How was this negotiated? How was this, uh, how did this happen? And what was your experience being part of, of the official delegation? Uh, and has the National Assembly been in more ways involved in the work of these two U UN Human Rights Treaty Bodies and maybe possibly as well the UN Human Rights Council? You have the floor now. Uh, 
Uh, you would have to unmute your mic. I think you have your microphone still muted. Okay, okay. Uh, yes, I was involved uh, in the two delegations because I worked at that time for the disability bill and I was involved with the stakeholders. And second, a very important issue which exists in Pakistan was the honor killing bill. And uh, I was very much involved with that also. And we were struggling in different spheres. So, and as I represented the Women Parliamentary Caucus, I was uh, doing a lot of work with the transgenders and uh, with other issues. So I was involved and I came uh, to Geneva for that. But as you know, it, at this time of the uh, year, the reports are normally prepared, you know, with the, with the oversight and with the involvement of the parliamentarians of both the national and the provincial assemblies and the commissions and the civil society. At least, and the Ministry of Human Rights, which exists of the government, it's, there are detailed discussions between the parliamentarians and the human rights commissions and the bills uh, which are being uh, formulated. And, uh, but, uh, you know, the sad part at the moment is, although the two human rights committees are with the opposition, but uh, unfortunately, both the Human Rights Commission and the National Commission on the Status of Women are non-functional as their uh, various chairpersons have not yet been uh, notified even after two and a half years. So interaction with the Commission is non-existent at the moment. And because and due to the COVID situation, the UPR report has not yet been started even. I hope uh, and the Committee on Human Rights is going to pressurize the government that during the coming times, there's more um, interaction or cooperation between the government and the opposition and other stakeholders. But as I mentioned earlier, the we are in a very difficult phase. There is too much polarization. There's division between parties and we are not sitting together or on webinar or there, there's no interaction going on between uh, uh, government or other stakeholders because of this polarization. So I am worried. I am concerned for what is happening because even the uh, COVID has... Uh, given the, the difficult times. The economy has really slowed down. Growth rate is low. The job sector is not doing well. And you know, when all this is happening, the, the thing that is affected is the human rights, which is affected and which is violated and which is abused and which is of a great concern. So I would like to hear what uh, suggestions you have and what can be done to achieve our uh, human right goals. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Pervais, for, for this frank assessment, uh, both uh, some positive elements, but also, as you've rightly pointed out, uh, some worrying elements uh, when it comes to the promotion of human rights in, in, in Pakistan. Um, I, I would now first like to turn to uh, uh, Lord Fusitua for a, a similar assessment in Tonga uh, of the extent to which the parliament has been able or not uh, to engage um, with these international human rights mechanisms. Sir, you have the floor. Thank you, Roger. In Tonga, there's, there's absolutely no engagement with the United Nations human rights organizations. Uh, we, in Parliament, the most that will come across uh, the debate floor will be a few paragraphs tucked away in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Ministry of uh, Internal Affairs, and the Attorney General's annual report. So, uh, also, as Gianni has mentioned, uh, our delegation to the UPR will always be a minister, our solicitor, or Attorney General, and our diplomat in London who's responsible for Geneva. There's no 
parliamentary involvement whatsoever. Uh, so the reason that this shouldn't be the case is that uh, our, our committee system, uh, uh, our legislature and our constitution uh, are set up in a very unique way in which uh, any report and recommendation of a standing committee of the House once passed and become, becomes a House resolution carries the weight of our constitution. Therefore, a sitting government can be held to account by a standing committee resolution, whether it's part of their government policy or not, whether they've accepted those human rights obligations uh, or whether they've acceded to that particular uh, United Nations instrument or not. If a standing committee of the House, for instance, our social services committee, our population and development committee, which is the one that was tasked with implementing ICPD ever since Cairo 94, uh, and uh, now our anti-corruption committee, which has resulted in our ascension to UNCAC. Uh, committee reports and, and recommendations have become resolutions which have held uh, our sitting government of the day to, to account. So this, as we all know, presupposes a government that observes the rule of law. So unfortunately for us, we had a previous government from 2014 to 2017, had a prime minister who explicitly stated in parliament that he did not recognize the rule of law. So that makes observation of these human rights obligations extremely difficult. So the fact that you have the standing committee uh, structure you're able to combat that in the house and because our constitution requires that cabinet plus the prime minister can uh, can constitute no more than 51 percent of the house as as soon as you move one member of cam cabinet to a conscience vote these resolutions of standing committees aren't too hard to come by so i think it's incumbent on our parliament uh, to become more active uh, with, respect to, with respect to the United Nations human rights, uh, both organisations and instruments, because of the, the very fact that uh, being forthright through the standing committee process can be so effective. Thank, thank you, Roger. You. Sorry. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for this uh, for this assessment of of, 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 of the situation in, in, in Tonga and also uh, you've already offered some uh, possibilities for uh, for stronger engagement uh, by Parliament particularly through it, through its standing committees in carrying out effective oversight of government action um, I, I would like to also ask uh, uh, Ms. Pato, you, you've been in the Malaysian Parliament since 2013, so you've, you've seen things uh, around you um, in your country, and I would like to ask you how you see your Parliament's engagement with these UN Human Rights Mechanisms. What, what has been your experience in, in, in what you have seen and what you have done? Um, thank you, um, Mr. Rajia, and to my fellow colleagues. Um, so, I, in 2013, I became an MP with the opposition, and then uh, it was actually quite difficult to speak on human rights issues at that time. And I realized slowly that at the end of the day, it is the government that has to be the one that is going to push for this sort of, of reforms, apart from the engagement with opposition MPs. Uh, in 2018, uh, historically, um, in the elections, the Malaysian people voted for a change and Pakatan Harapan be, became government. And I, I personally had seen a lot of initiatives, a lot of um, uh, support, a lot of um, comments actually made on opposing, defending, promoting and protecting human rights in Malaysia. And that hoping that there would be a spillover effect of what Malaysia is doing on human rights issues in the region particularly on what we are looking at, the Rohingya crisis from Myanmar uh, and what and, and others, other crises, especially on freedom of religion and belief, on the death penalty, on child marriages, on women's rights, and the rights of the Aboriginal people. Um, but sadly, uh, in 22 months, uh, 
um, this year in February, the Prime Minister resigned and that led to a new government being formed, a government that is not mandated by the people. And that has resulted in, I believe now, human rights issues taking, has been pushed further down the, the, the line of priorities of the government. Um, and I say this because um, in 2018, when we formed government, um, we had six plus four uh, parliamentary special select committees that have been set up, something unprecedented, never seen before in the Malaysian parliament by the speaker, the then speaker, Dato Arif. So we had six uh, parliamentary select committees on human rights, on gender, uh, and then we had additional four uh, select committees added on to and make sure that we don't miss out on speaking about issues that affect the people of the men on the street. But after the change in regime, we found that all these 10 select committees had been dissolved. And we find that in parliament now, um, and I must also add that, that upon the change of regime that happened in February, March, uh, we were due to have our first parliamentary sitting in March, and that had been postponed. Uh, only because I believe the Prime Minister was concerned if he didn't have the numbers or majority numbers to form government, there had been a lot of question whether he had he was having a safe government or not. And then in order to fulfill the six month period of from on, on parliamentary convening, uh, a one day sitting was called in May. May 18, one day, just to fulfill the requirement that parliament must convene within six months. Uh, prior from the previous date. And therefore, in that sitting, we could not discuss anything on setting up of human rights, uh, parliamentary human rights select committee, how do we engage with other NGOs and civil society, and particularly on the National Human Rights Institution in Malaysia called Suhakam. So we mooted that in the last sitting, which was in the July-August sitting, to push for a new speaker, by the way, <laughs> Even that, I believe, was a coup in Parliament for the government to push their own speaker to become speaker today. Um, and, and so far, it's 50-50. We have yet to see whether this speaker will still continue all the reforms that the previous speaker had put in place. Um, currently, we have, uh, the speaker had an, has announced nine select committees have been set up. Uh, titles given, but membership not yet announced. So Malaysia does not have a functioning parliamentary select committee on human rights. We only have five standing committees in parliament, uh, the public accounts <coughs> committee, um, the uh, selection committee, uh, none to look into matters of uh, human rights. But I believe the greater, the greater concern that I have when a government does not put human rights on the national agenda and therefore does not remind the people that human rights are issues that affect everyone. And it's not just about the ICERD, it's not, uh, not just about the ICCPR, it's not just about the Rome Statute, it's not about the ICC, the International Criminal Court, but it's about the right to education, the right to land, the right to water, Right to healthcare, women's rights, the right to employment, etc. And sometimes these kind of issues they get drowned when the government keeps speaking on bread and butter issues, which are naturally important issues as well. So when today an MP speaks about human rights issues, it's always looked on the far end of the spectrum, perhaps on LGBT rights, perhaps on ISERD, perhaps on the Rome Statute, which may not affect directly men on the street. And that is my question now. How do we make this kind of human rights issue a day-to-day -day issue that would affect the men on the street so that the men on the street, the voter out there, will then remind the government, have you kept to all your promises on human rights issues in Malaysia? Um, when we took over in 2018, I must also commend the minister of, the late minister of law at that time, that took I'm not sure if any, any of you had the privilege of meeting him. He passed away this year uh, and he was a visionary and he came up with three major important outlines uh, when the Malaysian delegation uh, were at Geneva in 2018. Um, one of it was um, to uh, annual meetings with civil society and NGOs, half yearly reviews of UPR 
uh, and also to institutionalize collaboration and engagement with national human rights institutions. I mean, this is really it's landmark. Uh, I have not seen previously the Malaysian government taking up the issue of human rights with this much of seriousness. Um, but I'd like to remain optimistic, uh, and I hope um, that the, 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 there are officers or even the minister himself or the deputy minister, whether it's for foreign affairs or whether it's for minister of justice, will take some time and consideration to look into the outcome of a conference like this, a timely conference like this. In a time of pandemic, we see more countries are building up walls instead of building bridges. Every country, every government is about me, myself, and I. And, and, and the battle against COVID, finding a vaccine, has created now what I think there is a COVID fatigue in the air as well. And this is extremely troubling. And as we know, in a time of crisis like this, it is often human rights uh, that is trampled on. And the, then there's no accountability, there is no uh, uh, check and balance because people are worried if they're going to lose their jobs, if they're going to food on the table, if, will my family be safe? So um, these are the things that I, I, I have to report uh, here uh, on the Malaysian situation. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I hope that uh, um, that my the Malaysian government, the, the cabinet, the prime minister, uh, even though he lacks majority in the house, <laughs> I think that with the little majority that he has, that he would he would uh, uh, move on these reforms um, because these were the reforms that Pakatan Harapan had brought to Parliament and also to institutions. Uh, and we would like to remind that even though this is not a government that's mandated by the people, that it is the duty of the government to hold on to the tenets. Uh, of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, to hold on to, to, uh, you know, to be a decent government, to do what is decent, to do what is right, uh, to be honest, to be, to be sincere, uh, assisting uh, people, particularly the minority. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Pato. Uh, also presenting a, a complex situation in, in, in Malaysia with uh, with uh, both difficulties uh, due to the political situation that you're experiencing right now, but you also strike at the same time an optimistic tone um, in, in, in the hope that things, that things will get better and that Parliament will get back at um, being a strong advocate of, of, of human rights. Um, I have further questions for the three of you, but uh, I also realize that we're running a little bit out of time. So um, I would like to see if there are any comments or questions from uh, participating MPs um, to you first, uh, with the suggestion that we continue this session for another 10 minutes or so. Um, so I'm turning around uh, to look at participating MPs, if there are any questions from the floor. Of course, if you want to raise a question, you can use, by clicking on participants, there is the option of, of um, pressing the button uh, raise your hand, or you can, of course, also uh, mention your question in the chat. So I'm just looking to see if there is anyone who would like to take the floor at this stage. Um, I, I, I don't, I don't see anyone. Uh, or oh, there's Miss uh, Miss Henderson. You have the floor, please. Uh, good afternoon or good evening, everyone. Look, I just wanted to um, make a couple of very brief remarks. And, and I just wanted to say that Australia's relationship with each of the countries represented uh, in this fabulous workshop um, is incredibly important. So one of the really vital roles that we can play as parliamentarians is to use our collective voice. Now, as I explained before, the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights I'm the chair and Graham Kerritt um, is the deputy chair. We don't um, have a role beyond that of a technical scrutiny committee. Uh, we do actually have uh, a subcommittee, a human rights subcommittee uh, of our foreign affairs and trade and defence committee, which engages in human rights issues and concerns beyond Australia's shores. Uh, but I, I just wanted to briefly mention that human rights has been a very big issue in Australia this year because of the pandemic. 
So not only as has our government taken some uh, very um, unprecedented action because of the economic crisis and the health crisis, uh, with so many people losing their jobs or having been stood down, we've had to take some uh, very urgent measures to support Australians with wage subsidies, with an extension of unemployment benefits, with never seen before incredible health supports through our telehealth system, um, a massive investment in uh, vaccines and a new vaccine manufacturing facility. So. Uh, for our government, and I'm a member of the government, I'm a Liberal Senator for Victoria, and I'm a member of the Morrison government. Um, Mr. Perrett is a member of the opposition. He's a Labor member of Parliament in the House of Representatives. Uh, but together as a country, we have faced incredible challenges. So I'm very interested to hear uh, about those challenges um, that each of you have faced uh, in light of what has been uh, obviously an incredible year. We don't have the same challenges that some of the countries have. I mean, the rule of law is a fundamental tenet of our democracy. Uh, I am deeply concerned to hear about some of these terrible situations that are being faced in Malaysia and Pakistan, uh, issues such as a subverting of democracy, uh, issues such as uh, honour killings and the like, uh, which uh, are very distressing. But as I say, I will end with where I began, and that is that together, I think we have got a very powerful voice in each of our respective parliaments, and uh, we have to ensure that we can continue to use that. Uh, and that's certainly my commitment, and I can speak for Mr. Perrot as well, our, our collective commitment in Australia to continue to use our voice, uh, particularly in relation to some of the atrocities we are seeing in other countries. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Ms. Henderson. Um, I also see that the uh, delegation from the Maldives would like to take the floor. So please go ahead. Thank you. Um, my question is uh, perhaps uh, maybe to Jani on um, the involvement of, of uh, parliaments um, in, the, uh, in the stage of compiling state reports um, to the UPR. Uh, although parliaments are one of the three branches of the state, the par parliament often functions as, a, as an oversight function as well. And human rights committees such as ours, we conduct um, heavy scrutiny and um, quite intense uh, oversight um, of uh, state obligations to promote, protect, and fulfill human rights. And so, um, I often find myself with this question on how do we balance these two functions in cooperating or working with the government in um, the stage of finalizing or compiling uh, a state report. Um, would a shadow report by a human rights oversight committee uh, be considered or, or, an, or accepted independently? Or, um, what, or what is the expectation of the system that we work with, oversight human rights committees work with uh, the state on the state report, or is there a expectation or perhaps space for uh, oversight human rights committees, parliamentary committees to submit uh, our individual information um, during the uh, uh, UPR process? Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this for this very interesting uh, and relevant question uh, about which also really touches on the uh, the direct role of parliaments in the in, in the UPR process and I will leave it to Johnny to respond in a, in a minute uh, again I see that we're running a little bit out of time I don't see any further questions um, and I, I will give the the the, the, the the floor back to the discussants for some final comments. I also realize that we started to, to touch on issues that will also be discussed uh, immediately after this session with both the situation, the effects, the impact of COVID on human rights, but also uh, something that we will look at tomorrow in more detail, which is really the specific kind of actions that parliaments can take to help implement uh, UPR recommendations. And I think this is also a key message for us is that 
Uh, yes, there may be difficulties in parliaments. Uh, it may be difficult due to polarization and other uh, political challenges to, to promote and protect human rights. But there are so many opportunities out there. The UPR system, uh, the UPR process, the, the work done by the UN Human Rights Treaty Bodies, all that information is publicly out there. It's available. It's, it's there for people to use. It's there for parliaments to use. So when we touch on the specific engagements that parliaments and parliamentarians foresee uh, as part of the UPR cycle tomorrow, when we address that at the last session, we really also would like you to reflect on how you, practically speaking, can use this publicly available information on both the process and on the recommendations forward. Now, um, I would like to go back to the discussions for some really uh, small final remarks, starting maybe with Johnny, because the last question that was put by the Maldives really focuses on the process. Johnny, you have the floor. Thank you, Roger. And, and uh, just to briefly say uh, to the question from the Maldives that uh, is very relevant, what we expect uh, in terms of uh, uh, best practice would be an opportunity for the parliament and especially its uh, human rights uh, committee to have a chance to be briefed about the state report being prepared by the executive or to participate in various consultation that the executive might have and might organize with the national institution, civil society and other state entities. Uh, we think that that is not happening and that is uh, therefore problematic. Uh, the review, the UPR review, it's also based upon all UN relevant information. And uh, we have touched upon the treaty bodies, but also special procedures mandatory, the UN system in country, um, the high commissioner statement on that particular country that may be relevant. It's all put together in a report prepared by the office of the high commissioner, which is called compilation of UN relevant information for the UPR. Another report, which is next to the state report and the compilation, is the summary of stakeholder information, which includes views from the National Human Rights Institution. And if it is an A status, it will have also a certain amount of wording that may be reserved to them and civil society organizations. So if you put all of those together, you see that the, the state report, if it includes also views or if it has gone through process of consultation uh, with the other two branches of the government, parliament and the judiciary, will complement what is already available out there from national human rights institutions, civil society organizations, as well as the entire UN system including treaty bodies and special procedures, mandate holder and the UN system at country level. Um, I think that uh, uh, we do not uh, therefore expect a shadow report from parliament. We would welcome an opportunity by parliament, whether a select human rights committee or other, to have had the chance to input into. That does not mean that the parliament should do the work of the executive on the contrary, but that you will have been consulted and that you will have had the view that is possibly reflected maybe in a part of that uh, national report which could be added parliamentary input or input from the parliament. So this is what we believe would be a possible way forward to ensure the voice of parliament is there. Of course, uh, if parliament or members of parliament have also close link with the National Human Rights Institution and civil society, more may emerge from those contributions, which are normally factored in and reflected in those two reports I referred to. And if I may, Roger, just to one point I would like to mention, uh, we have had these three experience of Pakistan, Tonga, Malaysia, all of them have gone through the third cycle. So they are part of the group of 124 countries uh, out of the 140 for which an outcome has been adopted in the council, the High Commissioner writes a letter to the Foreign Minister of those countries that have already gone 
the outcome adopted in the Council. Um, there is uh, there an indication of the recommendation that, he, that she provides to the executive, to the uh, foreign minister, but that are relevant to all other uh, uh, branches of the government, as well as other stakeholders at national level. Next to that, there is also a matrix which will match all the recommendation thematically that are, have been accepted by the state concern, that is to say, where there has been a sovereign decision to accept them, and they are linked to the SDGs so that they facilitate the action at country level between the human rights agenda and the development agenda, which often are two separate parallel agendas that do not seem to meet. And I think the practical guidance, which uh, has just been shared with all of you, is a reflection once again of how important uh, integrating these two elements is. And finally, there is an infographic which is available, all of this, the letter, the matrix, and the infographic, which has the trends between second and third cycle in terms of received and accepted recommendation, which shows also of the recommendations that you have received, what are the top five SDGs? And you will be surprised. It's not just the SDG 16, but there is also education, fight against poverty, other economic, social, and cultural rights. And I think that this gives you once again, the sense that human rights agenda and the development agenda needs to be integrated. And finally, there is an overview of what has been accepted by the government, by the executive, and therefore for us is uh, the beginning of a commitment to an action plan to each and every one of the sector concerned, whether it's a legislative framework, whether it's civil and economic rights, whether it is gender, child, vulnerable groups and in countries in conflict, IHL related issues. So that with a one pager, you have a quick snapshot of what has happened in the context of the UPR. And I see that uh, Ilya has just sent you the link where it is in the open for 124 countries already, this letter to the foreign minister, this matrix and the infographic, but very soon, it will be for all the other countries that haven't yet gone through the third cycle of the UPR or like the case of Maldives that are still considering of all the recommendation accepted, which one needs still to be uh, uh, supported by the states or just noted at this stage. Thank you. Thank you very much, Johnny. I saw that Ms. Parvais and uh, Ms. Pata also uh, wanted to respond. So if I can also ask you to to, to uh, if I can ask you to be brief um, in making your final comments on um, on the discussion so far, Ms. Pervais, you have the floor. You have to uh, unmute yourself. Uh, I have two great concerns. You know, the rising threat of Islamophobia to Muslims living in Europe and especially France. You know, in October 2018, the European Court uh, passed the verdict that insulting Islam's Muhammad will be punished, will be a punishable offense and uh, will not be counted as freedom of expression. Panel of seven judges said defaming or demeaning the prophet goes beyond permissible limits of an objective debate and could cause prejudice in the society and will risk religious peace. So uh, my concern is that uh, what is, uh, I mean, if I am allowed to ask, what is the Human Rights Commission doing on that, on this, and on the human rights violations, which have been continued for the last one and a half year in Kashmir. The women and children are being abused and deprived of their basic rights. So these are two very uh, uh, grave concerns of mine. I would like uh, the commission to uh, let me know what is being done on that, on both the issues. Thank you very much. I'm turning to Ms. Pato. Um, thank you very much. Uh, since I've already shared the Malaysian dilemma, 
uh, on how we are going to address human rights issues. I would just like to hear from uh, Mr. Magazzini, what is the way forward? Um, I think uh, lawmakers, particularly backbenchers, who are, I believe, uh, in many aspects, more vocal on human rights issues, is where there is a um, lacuna, I think, uh, where the executive don't seem so keen to take up uh, uh, human rights issues. We have many, many MPs today in parliament would speak up on human rights issues, but it would probably fall on deaf ears. How do we make the executive more accountable um, apart from these structures that are already in place, the UPR, etc., which doesn't compel uh, any government to submit a report, a review. It's, there is no, because it is only an international instrument, it is not binding in any way. So how do we make governments like mine more accountable and in, in plain English to grow a spine when they speak about human rights issues? Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Pato. Um, I will give the floor to Jani, but I think one of the reasons why we're also doing this workshop is so that parliamentarians can take inspiration from others and, and, and show to their own governments, well, listen, this is what is happening in a parliament next door or close by. This is how they're doing it. So the fact that that's working over there should also inspire us to hold you to account and use the same good practices that are being used elsewhere. And, and I think there as well, both OACHR um, and the IPU can be of help to parliaments in, in showcasing these examples so that you also have additional leverage uh, in your national context to tell the government, well, listen, it's not strange what we're asking for. This is happening already in other parliaments. Um, uh, Lord Fusitua, would you like to make some concluding remarks? Thank you, Roger. I think probably with my concluding remarks, uh, these issues are very specific to the Pacific, but as uh, it's an Asia-Pacific gathering, uh, I believe they're relevant to here. So I, I'd encourage my colleagues in other parliaments uh, to uh, address their advocacy, not, uh, not just for issues traditionally considered human rights issues, which are extremely important, uh, but those which may not necessarily be considered uh, human rights issues, and to also be both inwardly and outwardly looking. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, through our committee work and focus on the ICPD uh, since Cairo 94, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Tonga was able to pass uh, in 2013, it became law the year after, uh, the Family Protection Act which for the first time uh, criminalized, I mean, uh, established a definition for a domestic relationship and made uh, domestic violence uh, a crime uh, specifically, as opposed to the standard assault provisions in our Criminal Offences Act. Uh, so that was the first time that uh, women and children were given very explicit, uh, particular protection under our legislation. Um, uh, another example uh, of that is uh, the national consultation that we had uh, on by the TLA or the Tonga Ladies Association, which is our premier uh, LGBTQ plus uh, civil society organisation in Tonga. I was invited as a, an MP and chairman of the uh, Population and Development uh, Committee at the time. Uh, to address uh, this gathering along with uh, Cardinal Muffy, who is our first Tongan Cardinal, uh, former Attorney General, uh, other legal colleagues. Uh, they were addressing, um, as the Commonwealth Secretary has been working for in various countries around the world, uh, decriminalisation um, of uh, homosexuality and, and same-sex marriage. Uh, it's in what is an extremely 99% Christian country uh, that is popularly, um, outwardly considered an anathema to our, our Tongan culture. Uh, but rather than decriminalizing immediately, I was able to recommend to them to increase the protection provisions within the Family Protection Act to include other marginalized 
uh, groups that suffered uh, abuse, such as the LGBT community, rather than going directly for uh, decriminalisation, so that we can get immediate uh, results rather than the long-term policy uh, uh, work that it will take to convince a country like Tonga to deal with those. So that's an example of being inwardly looking on traditional uh, HR issues. In the Pacific, uh, what are not traditional HR issues, uh, but the premier human rights issues for us, uh, climate change and the protection uh, from climate change for us who inordinately suffer from it. Uh, so this uh, impinges on our right to life, which is a very basic human right. As we see our islands, and my colleagues from the Kiribati will attest to slowly ebb into the sea and go underwater. So not only do we have to be uh, advocates domestically, but also internationally to uh, the international uh, uh, bodies and organisations and our fellow uh, governments throughout the region and internationally. Uh, to deal with this issue, which is in my work in anti corruption, uh, the UNODC's most recent figures are that internationally, $4 trillion US annually gets siphoned off uh, by corruption. And their figures are also that within the Southern Hemisphere, we can deal with every single SDG for about 400 billion. Every single SDG and every single factor under every single SDG. So if we're able to address corruption, uh, which is impinges on, as I said, another one of our basic human rights, which is uh, the ability to live. Uh, these are less traditional uh, human rights issues which I would encourage my, um, my colleagues uh, to also advocate for, which may not necessarily have to do with the uh, uh, Office of the United Nations High Commission on Human Rights or the UPR uh, specifically, but I think, I think we should, on a macro level, also keep in mind. That's probably the, uh, my closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I realize as well that uh, well, at least two of the discussions also raised further questions, but just for the sake of time, because I realize we're really running late, I would suggest that we keep these questions that you formulated as well in the back of our minds as we continue with the, uh, with the workshop. Um, there's plenty of opportunity to come back to these questions later on, so uh, I, I, we, we should not forget them. Um, my suggestion now is, well, first of all, I would like to thank the, the discuss discussants for participating in this first session, which I thought was very enriching, highlighting both um, achievements and but also the difficulties that parliaments face in their national context and maybe also some of the common challenges that parliaments face across the board in promoting and protecting human rights. Um, before we move on to session two, which will focus explicitly on how COVID, COVID is impacting on the human rights situation across the world. I would first suggest that we take a small break, a five minute break, uh, not the 15 minute break that was originally foreseen in the, in the program because we, we've already gone well beyond that time. Just a five minute break for everyone to stretch their legs. Uh, please do not disconnect because then you would have to re-enter the meeting. So I would just suggest that if you want to switch off your cameras, uh, for the break, please go ahead and then we come back in five minutes. Thank you very much.
Hello um, again. I would like to ask uh, all participants to come back. Um, and um, before actually moving to the, uh, the second uh, session of the workshop, I would just like to give the floor back again to Johnny in light of the questions that were raised at the very end of the first session, just because as I originally suggested, maybe we can come back to these questions later on, but, but realizing now maybe it's best to address them uh, as we can right now before moving on to the, uh, the second session. Johnny, you have the floor. Thank you, Rogia. Very quickly, um, the UPR, of course, is not uh, a mechanism that will address and resolve uh, geographic, legal, bilateral issues and does not deal with individual specific case, including that may be the result of uh, court judgments. But it does take into account quite a great deal, the input from regional human rights mechanism as well, something which I had not flagged before. <clears throat> and uh, I think when it comes to the specific issue that have been mentioned, including the question of Kashmir, of course, uh, is a matter that is addressed in the UPR already undertaken, and also in the letter that the High Commissioner addressed to the Foreign Minister of the concerned country. So I encourage you to take a look at those documents, which are public and could be used for advocacy tools. On the question of the Maldives, I think the critical issue I would like to flag here is that uh, a parliamentary human rights committee does not need to be seen as uh, uh, an action of the opposition against the government, but actually can bring together government MPs and opposition, and they can all start on focusing on the oversight of what the government actually has accepted. I think that is at the entry point. Of course, uh, there will be need for time, but over time, this will also provide a great deal of respect for that committee, and it will play an increasingly important role domestically, regionally, where appropriate, but also internationally. So it will take some time, but I think this mechanism and the tools that we have made available publicly should allow Parliamentary Human Rights Committee to own potential drawbacks and see the usefulness of engaging with the government and other stakeholders so as to advance initially, at least in the area where the executive has already made a sovereign decision to act, to accept, to support, certain recommendation. Thank you, Rogier. Thank you very much, Jani. Um, and with those remarks, we have now officially concluded the first session of the workshop, and uh, we're now moving to the second session. Um, we're very pleased that we're doing uh, this workshop together with the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and with the Commonwealth Secretariat. And it gives me great pleasure now to give the floor to Mr. Tawanda Hondora, who is the acting uh, head of the Human Rights Unit of the Commonwealth Secretariat and who will be moderating the second session. You have the floor. Many thanks, Roger. Uh, I hope you can all hear me. Uh, honorable members, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you all. Uh, as mentioned by Roger, my name is Tawanda Hondora, uh, and I'm moderating this session. Uh, which is on strengthening parliamentary strategies for a better contribution to the promotion and protection of human rights at, at the national level in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. This session will look at the human rights, health and economic impacts of the pandemic, faced in particular by Asian and Pacific Commonwealth countries. The speakers uh, who, whom I'll introduce shortly will share best practice and will discuss how parliaments can promote and protect human rights, including in the absence of human rights committees during these challenging times. The session will also delve into the role of parliaments in assessing um, the economic and human rights impact of COVID-19 measures taken by governments to ensure, among other things, that government actions are compatible with the human rights obligations. It goes without saying that parliamentary involvement in the development of national human rights action plans is critically important, especially during this pandemic. It also includes parliamentary cooperation with other 
key stakeholders, such as national human rights institutions and civil society. We have four speakers today, uh, and of whom I'll introduce very briefly in order for us to be able to uh, catch up on the time that we've just lost. Um, we have Honorable Jihan Mahmoud, uh, who is a member of parliament in the Maldives. Uh, she's also the chair of the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Human Rights and Gender, and is also a member of the Parliamentary Standing Committee on the Judiciary. We also have Honorable Alvik Maharaj, who is a member of parliament in Fiji. Honorable Maharaj is currently the government whip and the Assistant Minister of Employment, Productivity and Industrial Relations and Youth and Sports. He is also the chairperson of the Standing Committee on Justice, Law and Human Rights. Thirdly, we have Mr. Sanjoy Hazarika, who is the International Director of the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative. CHRI is an international NGO that works for the practical realization of human rights through strategic advocacy and engagement, as well as mobilization on issues such as access to justice and access to information in Commonwealth countries. Last but not least, we have Professor Rosalind Croucher, who is the president of the Australian Human Rights Commission. Professor Croucher has had a distinguished career in legal education prior to joining uh, the Australian Human Rights Commission. She has 25 years of university teaching as well as management. Uh, the first question I'm going to ask uh, will be directed to Honourable Mahmoud. Uh, Honourable Mahmoud, could you take us through the measures that have been taken by the Maldives government in response to the COVID-19 pandemic? And if you could describe the role of Parliament so far with respect to those measures, as well as what role Parliament has taken in assessing the economic and human rights impact of the measures. Honourable Mahmoud. Can you hear my voice clearly? We can now. We can now. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> the Maldives Parliament uh, became the first Parliament in in the world to go virtual on the 30th of March. Our standing committees were also operating virtually, continuing parliament without recess, despite the challenges in COVID-19, <clears throat> despite the challenges COVID-19 posed in so many ways. Owing to the adaptation to a virtual modality of work, Sorry, we uh, were able Mahmoud, to- I think you yeah. are now on mute, so if you could unmute yourself. Okay, uh, can you hear me now? We can, yes, many thanks. Owing to the adaptation of our virtual modality of work, we were able to conduct close oversight of the national COVID response, monitor the socioeconomic impact of COVID, especially on vulnerable groups, hold live and robust national discourse on the response and impact to this pandemic of unprecedented scales. Therefore, <clears throat> we were able to strongly um, influence policy decisions and support the executive in the responses, including budgetary inter interventions uh, uh, and a special sunset legislation pertaining to COVID. I would also like to highlight that we were able to push through some landmark legislative amendments to the Criminal Procedure Code that allowed for justice system to continue without interruptions. Additionally, we were also able to continue with standard parliamentary duties, especially of legislating and preventing disruptions in the functioning of the parliament in these dire times. Most significant work, however, uh, undertaken during this period has been the parliamentary COVID, COVID reports, all 17 standing committees coming together with policy and legislative directions pertaining to COVID and producing their respective reports within the purview of the mandate of each committee. In this regard, for example, the Human Rights and Gender Committee that I chair analyzed the impact of COVID from a human rights and gender lens and increased need uh, and the increased need for special interjections pertaining to the social protection, especially of vulnerable groups. 
the guiding document for Human Rights Committee report was the OHCHR's initial guidance note on the human rights dimensions of COVID-19 published in March. And later on, of course, <clears throat> the thematic notes and guidance documents as we preceded our work. In this report, we were able to call upon the government to immediately conduct a social impact assessment to ensure that women and children are, in sa uh, are safe in uh, <coughs> their households, in fact, address those in unsafe households, have alternative ways for reporting abuse, ensure that women and families have uninterrupted access to contraceptives, family planning resources, and sanitary supplies. Special recovery programs were suggested to be put in place to ensure women working in the informal sector and those in home-based small businesses uh, to ensure that they're prevented from falling through the already existing social security gaps, which was crucial for the, uh, for the committee to consider because the committee was aware that women make up 40% of the informal sector as opposed to 31% of men. The committee report also called upon the government to recognize the double burden of care placed on women owing to the new realities of COVID and put measures in place to assist and empower families to share that burden. The committee drew the, uh, drew the attention of the government to threats facing migrant workers, migrant work, uh, the migrant workers, persons deprived of their liberty under state care, persons with disabilities and families facing the threat of eviction, all owing to the new circumstances created by COVID-19 way ahead in April. The report also issued policy directions to expedite income support schemes, especially unemployment benefits, support for relocation in events in event of displacements or into loss of income, both of which I must highlight have now been included, included in the 2021 proposed budget that we are discussing in the parliament today as we speak. The Human Rights and Gender Committee also issued a specific guideline for budget restructuring and asked the government to prioritize uh, <clears throat> state's investments in strengthening the health system, social protection of the most vulnerable groups, and upholding human rights obligations, and finally, creating job opportunities uh, uh, addressing the un um, unemployment situation. As we have uh, now embarked upon the budget scrutiny for the next year, this week in Maldives Parliament, the committee is now analyzing the budget to ensure that these priority areas have been thoroughly addressed. The committee has been working very closely also with the National Human Rights Institution to ensure that they are responding to COVID-19 effectively and efficiently. And also, especially with regard to their functions and responsibilities, particularly in fulfilling their mandates under uh, the CAT Convention and the optional protocol to the Convention Against Torture as well, because in it, the NHRI is the national preventive mechanism of Maldives. So um, <clears throat> what we have been able to therefore influence is uh, government policies on, on supporting the industries, uh, uh, the people affected by the industries that have crashed uh, and also people that have lost income and um, the, especially, the, especially taking a gender lens into it and scrutinizing, we continue to scrutinize the government response on who is receiving at the receiving end of this support. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Honorable uh, Mahmoud. Uh, you raised several important um, points there, including on uh, the issue of vulnerable persons. Uh, if I could perhaps ask uh, a question to Honorable Maharaj. Uh, if you could walk us through the challenges uh, faced by the Fijian government uh, following the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic um, and what Parliament has done uh, to promote and protect human rights uh, in these challenging times. And if, we could, if I could ask you perhaps to uh, limit your response to no more than five minutes. Uh, Honorable Maharaj. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, good evening, everyone, again from Fiji, um, and thanks for limiting my time. I was actually uh, willing to say that, that I'll try to actually have this more interactive in terms of we can actually have more discussions rather than me actually giving a very long and lengthy answer to this particular question. But as you know, that uh, Fiji's economy is actually basically driven by tourism. So when there was a COVID outbreak, overnight, our economy actually came to steal. 
uh, our major income that was coming through tourism uh, went vanished overnight. So the uh, majority of our revenue was lost. So we needed to actually prioritize a lot of things. Uh, we needed to prioritize how we can actually stimulate our budget. How can we actually stimulate our economy itself and uh, what can be done in order to ensure that uh, our economy still survives, our economy keeps running and not jeopardizing the basic human rights that uh, people would actually be facing on a day-to-day -day basis. So what we actually did was uh, at very initial stage uh, when COVID-19 actually hit the global arena, in very, I think it was towards the end of March, we came up with a COVID-19 response budget, which was a mini budget. Uh, it was actually six months before our national budget was announced. So we actually came up with this particular uh, COVID-19 stimulus budget to actually ensure that our economy keeps running. One of the major things that we did was to actually uh, ensure that our economy survives was, there was a lot of focus on civil service pay cut. But what we actually decided that it might actually have a very negative impact if we actually go ahead with a civil service uh, pay cut. So we decided not to, because on daily basis, uh, in a country which has a population of basically around 800,000 um, population, we inject uh, close to almost $4 million, $4 million Fijian dollars, which is close to around 2 million USD on daily basis towards our economy. And that actually had a very positive response because once we would have actually decreased our civil service pay, we would have actually seen that our civil servants would have actually gone to saving mode rather than the spending mode they were in. So they actually continued spending. And uh, that was one of the way our economy kept, uh, was boosted. And we have a good uh, sound economy at this point in time. We are still waiting for the tourism door to open and our national carrier to start flying so that the tourism can actually fork into Fiji, one of the most safest places in the world at the moment with zero COVID cases. So we are very hopeful that very soon we might be able to actually work with the Bula bubble with Australia and New Zealand and with our Pacific uh, neighboring countries uh, so that we can actually ensure that our economy survives. Uh, the other thing with regards to um, parliament, I think we have actually gone virtual. Uh, Justice Law and Human Rights Committee is where basically we get annual reports, we get uh, laws, bills before us. So in order uh, to ensure that uh, human right is not jeopardized or deprived, people are deprived of their human rights, uh, we have gone virtual. So all the submissions and everything these days we are actually collecting virtually. Currently we have one bill before us, uh, which is cybercrime bill. And we have collected at least more than 50 virtual submissions, uh, which is a very uh, positive, uh, a positive thing for our parliament at the moment. Uh, with this uh, brief words, I would like actually to hold on here for a while and we'll hear more very shortly. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Honorable Marait, for that uh, response. Uh, if I could ask uh, Mr. Sanjoy Hazarika, uh, you're a representative of a civil society organization. Um, I would like to know what role your organization has played in promoting human rights during this period uh, and what role you, you believe should be played by civil society more broadly. Um, in addition, what role do you think the parliaments should play to ensure the promotion and protection of human rights uh, during this period? Thank you, uh, Chair, uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Um, you know, uh, organizations like uh, the Commonwealth Human Rights Organization Initiative, whose core areas of work are with public institutions like police and prison systems, as well as information systems and mandate holders. We've had to really quickly find nimble ways of working with them across South Asia, across other, other geographies as direct access was initially effectively cut off to maintain social physical distancing norms. And uh, I think for uh, civil society groups in South Asia, the challenges too has been to get virtual factual information out 
through in, the information co commissions and through the, the human rights uh, institutions, as well as uh, collaboratives and reach vulnerable groups, including victims and survivors of trafficking and contemporary forms of slavery. And there's been a huge step up uh, by NGOs, including one unit of our own, uh, to assist groups and communities who have been hurt most by the pandemic in terms of getting essential supplies and relief measures, food, uh, drinking water, uh, and care, especially for the elderly and the most vulnerable. Uh, CHI has also put out a, a, a report on COVID-19 in prisons in the Commonwealth, uh, which has we have uh, sent across uh, Commonwealth countries uh, through the Commonwealth Secretariat and uh, for best practices, including ways to spread, uh, prevent the spread of the contagion in closed institutions like prisons and detention centers. We have uh, another uh, major problem across the world, uh, and it's not just uh, in, in one geography, which is the domestic violence uh, against, uh, violence against intimate partners is on the rise during the lockdown. And uh, some of our groups have continued to play a very important part in ensuring that uh, those who are most vulnerable have access to uh, rights and to the justice system. I think two of the challenges, and I close with that, two of the challenges which remain before um, organizations working in the civil society sphere is um, in advocating rights during the pandemic, because it's very important to defend freedom of expression and especially journalists who are doing the professional duty. In many cases, there are too many cases of media workers being intimidated and uh, detained and uh, also by non-state actors. But social media can also be a force for good, not just for uh, prejudice. We uh, feel a great need for much greater cooperation between parliaments, the executive, the national human rights institutions and the civil society uh, actors. Uh, we've seen across the world uh, and across the Commonwealth, NGOs have worked hand in hand with governments and sometimes in places where governments the state could not reach to avoid, uh, to provide assistance and support. And this is something I referred to earlier. And I think that uh, uh, it's very important for parliaments to ensure that legal basis for emergency measures are up to date and informed by current realities. And uh, I think that uh, the special committees, which some of you, the members of parliament here, may be better <clears throat> placed to, to discuss and present on, to monitor the implementation as exists in New Zealand and uh, Canada to, to uh, ensure parliamentary oversight. Because I think that parliament in many countries of Asia, especially in the Commonwealth, have not met often enough to, to discuss the different aspects of health and economic impacts and the conditions of the most vulnerable. And that critical laws which uh, affect the functioning of civil society need to be passed with <clears throat> consultation of uh, the partners and grassroots organizations who work, uh, which work among the most vulnerable and marginalized group, groups. And I think oversight is very important and parliament is really key in, in, in uh, playing that role. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hazareka. You certainly do raise an important point there, which is on uh, the need for parliamentary oversight, especially over regulations uh, that are passed by the executive, um, given the implications that that you know often comes from uh, such legislation, which is obviously passed uh, in the public good, uh, but, but also sometimes has the impact of restricting certain rights. Uh, so I believe that's a question, perhaps an issue that we'll be able to discuss in more detail uh, as we're progressing. If I may turn to you, uh, Professor uh, Rosalind Croucher, um, you, you're from uh, the Australian Human Rights Commission. Uh, and the question I have for you is, if you would tell us about the relationship uh, that exists between the Commission as well as the government generally, um, and whether or not that relationship has changed, has been impacted in any way following uh, the outbreak of the pandemic and the measures that have been introduced uh, in Australia. Professor. 
thank you very much, Chair, and um, greetings to all our uh, distinguished attendees across the world. Um, I am delighted to offer some observations from the perspective of the National Human Rights Institution of Australia. Um, the, the role that we have had is uh, a continuing one. Um, the, the ability as the National Human Rights Institution to offer advice as a trusted friend is um, more important during this time than ever. Um, we have a key role in advising um, in, when bills are before Parliament. We have a key role in advising ministers, departments, um, throughout normal times. But during these extraordinary times, it's been more important than ever to have the human rights lens and, and voice um, in, in play. Certainly our government, uh, all governments in Australia, um, have responded very, very quickly to the, the pandemic and indeed have contained its spread remarkably well. But the, the principal concern, and, and this echoes, I think, previous speakers who have emphasised the importance of democratic accountability and the role of parliaments as the, the place through which that democratic accountability can occur. And um, in the previous session, I was delighted to see the chair uh, which I attended briefly, uh, the chair of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights making some observations, that was Senator Henderson. And um, the, that is an important parliamentary committee in terms of human rights issues. However, one of the key issues in Australia and probably in, in many Commonwealth countries has been the use of emergency legislation. Now, emergency legislation is a perfectly appropriate thing in, in terms of responding to emergencies and the, the right to life and the concerns of public health are an important motivating factor for limiting certain other human rights, like the right to movement, um, like the right to assemble, uh, even the right to travel um, can be limited in the interests of public health. However, the, the problem becomes and this is where the, the ability for parliamentary committees and also national human rights institutions really comes to the fore. The problem is when those emergency leisure measures are essentially executive measures which are not amenable to scrutiny. Now, that, that is a real problem. The measures are necessary, but without the, the, the ability to scrutinise, to... to um, to, to put that human rights focus on, are these measures for the shortest time possible? Is this the least restrictive measure that is needed? Much can be done in the name of emergency measures that actually trespass quite significantly on human rights concerns. That can be legitimate so long as those measures are open to parliamentary scrutiny. And that is where roles like parliamentary committees to democratic processes and indeed national human rights institutions can really play a, a very strong role. And so um, that is the, the key role. But in, in, in general terms, um, the kinds of activities that the Human Rights Commission has been able to play so when measures like um, an app for a telephone was suggested that could help in contact tracing, the Human Rights Commission was consulted at an early stage because of course that has significant privacy um, um, implications. We were also involved in providing guidance for health and disability care providers in making decisions in relation to persons with disability. So certain points which were real um, sites for engagement in human rights terms and dealing with our most vulnerable. So assisting um, the determining solutions that had a human rights focus in them. But given that we're speaking largely about parliament, um, the, the, the role of parliament as a scrutineer of emergency actions has been seriously constrained. And it is a matter that we have drawn to the attention of government recently when we had a, a, a hearing um, in which we presented our concerns. 
So perhaps, I, Chair, I can just leave that as some brief opening observations and, and I'll see where the, 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 the question and answer may take us. Uh, thank you, Professor. If I might ask you a follow-up question, uh, which is, you, you, you talked about uh, the Commission being consulted uh, by, I presume, the government or parliament uh, as legislation has been passed through parliament. Uh, parliament. Um, the question I have is, is that based on a formal framework of cooperation? Is that a legal obligation? How does it operate uh, in Australia? Uh, thank you. A uh, part of our statutory mandate, um, and we are an A-status um, human rights institution, um, part of our statutory mandate is to provide comment on, on certainly on, com on the Commonwealth laws that in, um, engage human rights issues. So part of our statutory mandate is to do so. Um, in terms of an obligation to consult, the Parliament has an obligation with respect to bills before it to um, take into account human rights commitments. So there is a parliamentary committee of which Senator Henderson is the chair and Mr. Perrett, who was, uh, I don't think he is uh, participating anymore, but he is the deputy chair. So there is an obligation for parliament itself to consider human rights issues. Um, we do not have a federal human rights act as such. So the mechanism is a scrutiny committee in the parliament, but there are difficulties chair um, with that committee, which we have drawn attention to in, um, um, in various um, uh, submissions, which is that sometimes the committee's reports are provided, but the legislation is already in place. So there are some issues with respect to deeply embedding human rights thinking into our parliamentary processes. But for the, from the perspective of the Commission, we have a very powerful mandate. And, and given that we have been um, instituted on a permanent footing since 1986, so nearly 30, 35 years, um, we have taken that role of providing submissions to Parliament very, very seriously. And so on average, we would make 40 to 50. So almost one a week, um, we make a submission in terms of legislation before the Parliament. Um, and that has prompted um, almost as many calls to give evidence directly to the parliament. So uh, we are considered a very authoritative voice, both in practice in discharge of our mandate, but because of the, the weight of the evidence that we are able to provide as a strong human rights voice in this country. Thank you, Professor. I understand that we have uh, members of parliament from Australia uh, uh, in the audience. So if you, those of you who are here with any questions, please put those in the chat function and we'll have a look at those. Now, if I might ask uh, a follow-up questions to honorable members from the Maldives and Fiji uh, regarding your own countries and whether parliament uh, has, um, regarding the oversight that has been played by parliament uh, with regards to emergency legislation passed by government um, and also whether um, the legislation itself uh, can be challenged in court by those who believe that uh, it is over is overbroad or whether or not uh, and potentially that it breaches a particular right or a provision of the constitution so perhaps we start with uh, Honourable Mahmoud. Sorry, Honourable Mahmoud, uh, we can't hear you. Richard? Oh, can you hear me now? I'm so sorry. We can hear you now. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Apologies. Um, Yes, uh, with regard to your first question, um, uh, with especially um, um, when we have a law uh, uh, sent to Parliament uh, with human rights implications uh, or human rights uh, obligations uh, that the state needs to fulfill, uh, these bills are uh, 
directed to the Human Rights and Gender Committee. Um, uh, we have 17 thematic committees, as I um, highlighted previously. So um, those pertaining to uh, those uh, bills pertaining to uh, the judiciary go to the judicial, uh, the judiciary committee, etc. But we often uh, work together on important issues such as transitional justice issues, on gross human rights violations. When we have laws um, um, pertaining to that nature. We, the committees work, work as joint committees to scrutinize and heavily scrutinize um, bills uh, from a human rights lens uh, and a gender lens. And um, we also um, um, seek the advice of civil society. It's actually mandated in uh, the committee's protocols, uh, standing orders. Uh, seek the advice of uh, the National Human Rights Institution. Um, individuals, uh, individual voices on uh, certain rights, um, and also uh, civil society organizations. So as a result, uh, evidence-based scrutiny has become quite um, heavy uh, in, the, in the Maldives parliament. And responding to your second question, I, I, uh, I, yes, uh, it is possible um, um, for an individual or even an entity to challenge uh, a law uh, if, it, if they believe it is in contravention to um, any human rights prin principle enshrined in Chapter 2 of uh, the Bill of Rights in our Constitution. I, I think on that note, I would give the opportunity to the Chair of the Judiciary Committee, uh, Honorable India Swami, to add uh, um, uh, to um, uh, if, he have, if he has anything to add to that uh, question. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, it's a pleasure to be participating in this wonderful meeting. Um, like uh, Ms. Jihan just mentioned in a speech as well, um, our parliament was maybe can be the first parliament that went virtual during the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, we uh, took uh, immediate measures, the Parliament Judiciary Committee as well, uh, took immediate measures. We made recommendations to the relevant authorities, the judicial sector, including the prosecutor general, the um, judicial watchdog, and uh, employment tribunal as well, made immediate recommendations to be uh, brought about um, that can uh, violate uh, the rights of the people, uh, citizens. Uh, also, um, we noted that the corruption can always uh, have a, neg neg a negative impact on uh, protecting and promoting human rights. Um, uh, the parliament issued directives um, um, and recommendations to the Auditor General to do quarterly audits on um, the various agencies um, of the government. Uh, this had a um, uh, good e effect and impact as well. Um, recommendations to the judicial sectors we made as well, uh, like I said. Also, the uh, we have experienced that the health emergency law um, that that is in place right now, this has to be amended. Now a new uh, bill has been proposed to the parliament, uh, which gives a significant role to parliament uh, during such a crisis um, in order to protect the rights of the people. Um, right, this is for the time being that I'd like to know. Thank you so much. Uh, if I might ask the same question uh, to Honorable Maharaj uh, regarding uh, the situation in Fiji, uh, could civil society organizations, for example, or people that are aggrieved be able to uh, challenge um, emergency legislation passed um, and also you know, general oversight um, in parliament itself. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir, for that opportunity. Uh, before I actually answer that, I'd like to actually take everyone through uh, to the process that we have in Fijian parliament. Uh, whenever a bill is actually introduced, we have three readings. So what mostly happens is attorney general actually uh, does the first reading of the bill, and then the bill is actually presented to the Justice, Law and Human Rights Committee. So it is uh, an independent parliamentary committee which is responsible to scrutinize that particular bill. 
uh, take it across to each and everyone in Fiji. We have public submission, we collect in submissions, and then we actually present a report. So all the stakeholders, uh, including the general public, they are actually allowed to come and do the presentation on any particular bill that is before the committee. So the committee in our parliament has the powers to actually amend the bill. So if the committee actually feels that any kind of right is suppressed or anything they deem not fit to fit in that particular bill, we have the powers to actually do the amendments itself. It doesn't have to be done by the whole of parliament, but the committee has the powers to do so. So that's basically what we do. And then it goes for the second reading whereby we have a committee of whole. Uh, in committee of whole, what we basically do is we go through clause by clause and we actually vote on each clause of the bill itself. So if any member, any MP or anyone who's not actually happy with a particular clause, they can actually again, during the second reading, pass an amendment and then it needs to be voted on. And once we are actually able to pass the, all the clause, then we actually pass the bill and then it actually goes for the third reading. And then actually after that, it goes to our president who actually then endorses it and it becomes an act. For some reason, if any of our citizen or civil society, they still feel that the particular act that is in place is actually depriving somebody of their constitutional right, they can actually go for a constitutional redress in either high court, court of appeal or Supreme Court in Fiji. They can actually, um, um, challenge those particular laws in the court as well. So that is our basically our process in Fiji. Uh, thank you, Honorable Maharaj. Uh, if I just ask a follow-up question uh, with respect to emergency legislation that's passed not by parliament, but rather by the government itself, and whether or not uh, that is subject to oversight by, by parliament, uh, and or whether or not it can actually be challenged in court. Actually, what happens in Fiji, we don't have any emergency uh, emergency law that is passed by the government. Any law that is passed is passed by the parliament. So even if it is actually what we say is under 51, uh, we expedite the process, but it still it has to go first reading, second reading and third reading. So even if it does not go to the general public for the scrutiny or to the uh, Committee on Justice, Law and Human Rights, it's still debated within the parliament between the opposition and the government MPs, and then it's actually passed. All right. But even that bill, it can also be challenged in the court as well. Thank you so much for that response. Uh, if I'm, now I might turn to uh, Mr. Hazarika um, with regards to uh, the challenges that you've seen as a member of the civil society in uh, Asia and the Pacific region. Um, with you know challenges faced by civil society uh, following the outbreak of the COVID-19 and abilities to uh, influence the passing of legislation or amendment of legislation. Uh, well, Chair, um, I would simply like to answer it by, um, I look at three points. The first is that I wish that um, since this is largely a Commonwealth related uh, uh, convening, that all countries and parliaments of the con parliaments of the Commonwealth take up the uh, good practices which have been uh, shown by uh, the Republic of Fiji and and the Maldives in terms of uh, the parliaments going virtual and uh, having oversight over issues of rights and so on. I think that is a, a great uh, tribute to their uh, internal strength. The second I would uh, like to say, the second point I'd like to make is really Mahatma Gandhi held up a talisman for everybody who was about to take an important decision in their lives. And this is true whether it's for members of parliament, for governments, for civil society, academics or whatever it is. I shall give you a talisman. Remember the face of the most unfortunate person that you have seen in your life or recently and ask yourself if the action you are contemplating will benefit him or not. 
on that basis you decide what you do and i think that that is very important especially in this very difficult and challenging times for everyone uh, whether you're confined to home or your office or wherever. And I think there are five, uh, shall we say, pillars, uh, which uh, I will cite them very um, briefly, which is that uh, when decisions are taken, whether by the executives or by the executive or by parliament, um, one has to look at the issues of proportionality, legality, and the justice, the universe of justice in those, in those decisions. Uh, the third is um, uh, the issue of public uh, interest and what is truly in the public interest and how does one determine that? Unless there is the fourth point, which is transparency. And I think in all these, there is a great deal of need for uh, an increase in all these, all these qualities, shall I say, because this has been um, a, a challenging uh, time for all, not just governments and uh, human rights institutions, but also civil society and media. And I think it is through these uh, lenses, shall we say, that we can uh, work together. But it is a challenging time, and there's no just no question about it in every way. Thank you so much for that response. Uh, if I could ask uh, if there's anybody with any questions uh, to please put your hand up. Uh, in the meantime, if I could ask uh, Professor uh, Croucher um, a question on how you've, what strategies you've come up with uh in, in order to be able to enhance your interaction uh with members of parliament because they are under a lot of pressure there are travel restrictions um parliament parliaments tend to be busy uh, especially during this period and so how have you what strategies have you employed in order to make sure that there is enhanced engagement uh, thank you, Chair, for a most um, insightful question. Um, I, I would say that our normal modus operandi is to ensure open doors. And whether it's uh, ministers, shadow min ministers, parliamentarians, our approach is um, from an, in a normal day to day to have that open door and the open contact. And um, while the issues perhaps have changed somewhat in the current environment, the modus operandi has not. Um, and so we have direct contact with parliamentarians. We also have um, very active engagement with the departments that provide the support and advice to members of the government. So I think, um, uh, that has been a key role. Also participating in, in various groups um, uh, of particular interest, like um, our um, Sex Discrimination Commissioner was involved uh, with, in a working group with heads of gender agencies in this country to provide a brief directly to government on key issues for women. Um, the parliament itself has convened a COVID committee which has the responsibility for scrutinizing um, particular legislation and the impacts um, um, in, in, a, in a COVID context. So um, I suppose, um, Chair, it has been more of the same, but more focused on the particular issues that arise, and particularly in circumstances where Parliament hasn't met with the same frequency that it may have. And I commend um, member states who've given examples of parliaments that have gone virtual. I think we've all learned a, an enormous number of uh, tricks um, in, in communication, in, in being able to participate, even in how we work. And so I think the, the lessons we've all learned, whether as um, 
in, in our work life and in, in our personal and work lives, I think we will take away many good lessons for engaging um, uh, across all spheres. Thank you, Professor. Uh, is, if there's anybody with any questions which they might wish to raise, uh, you may put your hand up. If not, perhaps if I, uh, Mr. Akio Afuda, you're on mute. Uh, It's rather Mr. Sanjoy. I was I was uh, informing you that Mr. Sanjoy would like to take the floor. Ah, all right. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Azarika. This always happens on a Zoom. You get zoomed out because uh, you do too many of these things and then you forget to unmute yourself. No, I just wanted to point out one thing that uh, while many things are being done uniquely uh, through, uh, through uh, virtual processes such as this one, inexpensively also at little cost to the exchequer except to our time, uh, there's an extraordinary uh, process which cannot be done virtually, which is elections, whether it's in the United States or in our own countries. And we've just had a very challenging and important election in a part of India, a major state of India, where, you know, the, the public civil society, the public participates in these great experiments of democracy. And I think it is very encouraging to see that people have kept physical distancing, uh, perhaps not as much as in the rallies, but certainly in terms of voting. And I think that is a good augury of the times to come, that people have faith in the system and want to assert their, their right to choose their own leaders and uh, express the views in a frank and fearless way. So I just wanted to make that point. Thank you. Sure. Thank you so much. Uh, Honorable Shaista. Sorry, you, you're mute as well. Uh, thank you. Uh, I just want to, you know, commend it because of uh, non-availability of facilities of going virtual. Uh, the assemblies and the committees in our Pakistan, they were really literally non-functional during the six months. And, uh, you know, we were governing through ordinances and without uh, transparency and uh, scrutinies. But, you know, we opened up for two months. And again, literally, we are now again toward going towards uh, uh, non-functional assemblies and committees. But as being pointed out, the constraints, the economic constraints are there. The economy is not well. So I don't know how we will proceed because it is yet no facilities have been uh, put in place for going virtual. And although the government did take up a few good uh, incentives, which were that social net uh, protection uh, programs uh, that was financial support to uh, families was given and already now the government is giving incentives to the industries also but you know the education is suffering as the public sector schools where 80 percent of our children go are literally without any virtual or anything and the schools are closed so it's a matter of great concern because uh, domestic violence child abuse is on the rise and uh, I mean there's a sense of gender depression and tremendous mental and psychological strains are there. Uh, I don't know how we will proceed and how we will handle this great challenge. It's a huge challenge for underdeveloped countries. Yeah. Th thank you so much for those remarks. Um, we is now uh, a minute uh, past, um, and I will. I would like to thank uh, honourable members, honourable uh, Mahmood, uh, as well as honourable uh, Maharaj, uh, for taking time to talk to us and for um, the remarks that you gave, as well as uh, Mr. Hazarika and Professor Croucher. Um, I will now uh, hand over to Elia Novikov. Over to you, Ilya. Thank you very much. Uh, we have almost concluded the first part of uh, this workshop.
And I would like now to give the floor to Mr. Magazzeni, Mr. Huizenga, and Mr. Hondora for some concluding remarks for today. Thank you very much. I have certainly followed very closely the discussion so far, and I'm very pleased to see not only the challenges and what remains to be done, but also the positive energies and the initiatives that are prevailing in most uh, parliaments in this region that may strengthen the cooperation and the engagement with the Human Rights Council, with the Universal Periodic Review, and also with the rest of the human rights uh, mechanism. We believe that this will really strengthen your role as a key player at the national level between the international and the domestic agendas. And with those few words, I would like to wish you a good evening or afternoon. All the best. Um, thank you, Ilya. Um, I, I would also like to thank everyone, uh, participants and, um, and discussants for, for their contri contribution. I think it was a very enriching first day uh, of this workshop. I would like to already start looking at tomorrow because tomorrow we'll have a, we'll have a final session of this event, which will focus specifically on what parliamentarians in the region intend to do when it comes to implementation of the UPR recommendations. Uh, you have all received the UPR recommendations that apply to your country and uh, we really want the session for tomorrow to be as practical as possible. Um, the organizers have highlighted in those set of recommendations for your country which ones we believe uh, would benefit from parliamentary follow-up. So my request to you is in preparation for tomorrow's session for you to really have a close look at those recommendations. Because uh, as I mentioned, we want that session to be as practically focused as possible. Uh, and for us to be able to hear from you what you can and intend to do with regard to those um, uh, UPR recommendations. And also possibly to discuss with you how we as uh, the organizers of this workshop can be of assistance to you. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Ilya. Uh like other speakers, I too would like to thank uh, the speakers today uh, for what they've been able to share. And if I may highlight uh, just a few things uh, that I think are critically important. The first uh, is that uh, is an issue that was raised by uh, the Honourable Member Mahmoud from uh, the Maldives. Uh, and that's with regards to the impact of COVID-19 on what I call the vulnerable person. So people, uh, you know, women, children, people in prisons, uh, and the need for countries as a whole to think about the measures that need to be taken uh, in order to make sure that those vulnerable uh, people, that their rights are protected. Um, in addition, obviously, to uh, all the other measures that are, 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 are taken. And also, I think remarkably, um, is the process for passing bills um, in Fiji, which, uh, because it allows um, scrutiny uh, of bills, even if they're being passed, uh, you know, um, especially as an emergency measure, that they have to go through Parliament, uh, that is a, uh, is, is, is a mechanism uh, that could be helpful uh in um addressing some of the challenges that we've seen in many other countries uh regarding the role or the limited role that parliament has needed to uh needed to play uh, and so there are lessons there that can be uh, that, that can be drawn as well as uh you know the remarks made by uh, uh professor croucher uh, on the relationship and the legal uh, legal relationship between the australian human rights uh, association, uh, I think that's, that's the name, as well as the, uh, and, and the government and the role in passing uh, legislation. Um, again, that's a critically important um, process uh, that helps draw attention to all the challenges uh, that 
could arise, especially uh, during this pandem pandemic. Um, this has, for me, is my first uh, meeting that I'm attending, uh, and I must say that I have enjoyed it, uh, and I look forward to uh, the meeting tomorrow and further meetings as we uh, proceed. Back to you, Ilya. Well, thank you very much. Uh, this brings us to the end of the first day. We are uh, only eight minutes uh, behind time, so we've made it, and we are very much looking forward to see you all tomorrow. Thank you. And goodbye. Thank you. Thank you again. Bye, everybody. Thank you.